This week, the city of Chicago has reached an all time low. According to ABC and other media outlets, a person has been shot in this city every single day for the past two years. These include someone's child, friend, or loved one. Now today in our studio are guests who've been afflicted and impacted by gun violence. Now as we seek answers, solutions, and alternatives to combat such an ugly side of the city, we find hope and refuge here today that those who are afflicted are able to be here and share their stories. In a city where your neighborhood determines whether or not you see tomorrow, today we're all thankful. Well, a pleasant good evening to you and yours. Thank you so much for joining us. This is The 30. I am your host, Joshua Short, and today we've got a packed house. Later on in the show, James T. Wiley, I'll call him Tony, he'll be live in the studio to speak about his book, Soul Survivor, where the battle between CPD and members of street organizations are illuminated. We also have two guests from two adjacent Southside neighborhoods with similar stories on the impact and toll gun violence takes on them daily. All that and more coming up, but as we kick off the final season of the 30, we begin with the 30 throwback. This is where we bring back a past guest from a past episode from one of our last two seasons. And kicking off the show for the short circuit, which focuses on issues involving Columbia or its students, is Bree Bracey. She's back here and she's gonna tell us how she's been impacted by gun violence. A couple of years ago, her niece was shot at just the age of 13. Bree, we appreciate you being back here on the show and sadly under these circumstances, but how are you? I'm good. How are you, Josh? Fantastic. Tell us a little bit about your cousin. Okay, so when my cousin was 13 years old, uh, this was many summers ago, mm -hmm. she was with my sister and my sister's mother just hanging out outside of their house. And new neighbors had just moved in across the street who seemed to get upset be for who knows what reason with my sister and um, my niece and a physical fight. Um, happened. They came over and they started fighting. My niece and my sister and my sister's mom tried to get them away from my niece and they called the police and the police never came and this altercation um, turned into a shooting. Um, when the father of these teenagers next door came out, pulled a gun on my cousin and shot her, mm -hmm. two more people were shot, including a nine-year-old who was shot in the throat, and um, the police didn't come until after my sister had taken everyone to the hospital and come back in the early hours of the morning. Really? So, so it took a while for CPD to arrive at the scene? Right. It's crazy because now she's 20, in her 20s, correct? Yes. How is she now? How has that incident impacted her life going forward? I mean, she's healthy, thank God. Like, she's doing, she's doing fine physically, but I think when something like that happens, the emotional impact never leaves you. And just for, for a shooting to happen in general is such a horrible thing, but to know that the police were not there for you. Mm -hmm. And afterwards, they, the man couldn't be charged with attempted murder because nobody was shot above the chest. And the nine-year-old who was shot in the throat, it was a graze wound, so it didn't count. <sighs> and so uh, his sentence was slightly lesser. And as well, my sister felt that she couldn't press charges because if she did, she could get in trouble for um, fighting in self-defense against these neighbors. So all of these things seem to be working against them when the system is supposed to be there for you. Mm -hmm. And I think all of that really explains why there's this mentality that people don't trust police officers because when things like that happen, what are you supposed to do? The police are supposed to be there for you. So I'm sure that she's going to be dealing with those things all her life. And, you know, my family lives in Chicago, so it's just mm -hmm. really difficult knowing that you can't be safe in your home. What does that say, though, about the system that we're in right now in Chicago, from the Chicago Police Department on down? What does that say about how this guy was in charge or he wasn't charged the way the family at least wanted him to be charged? What does that say about our system and what can be done about that? Well, I think that police officers, first of all, shouldn't be selective about who gets in trouble for certain crimes and when they respond to phone calls. Mm -hmm. I remember growing up listening to the song 911 is a joke by Public Enemy, and they say, the first line of the song is, I called 911 a long time ago. Yeah. Can't you see how late they're reacting? Like, uh -huh. it's 
embarrassing that if you call the police, they can't come there and respond to you. Mm -hmm. I know when I first transferred to Columbia a week after I got here, uh, my butt was grabbed in the street and I was knocked over. And I called campus security. They drove me to the police department. The police were very kind to me. They had me file a police report. All of that got dealt with right away mm -hmm. for something like that. But when my cousin, or in my, oh, sorry, when my niece is shot, there's no one there to, mm -hmm. to help her. So, so that is a huge problem. I think police officers should do their job. Yeah. And I'm, I should say though that I'm not implying that police in general never right. do their job, but I mean, I think if there's a crack anywhere in the system, it mm -hmm. needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. And I also think as far as just people living in neighborhoods in Chicago, there's a lot of people who feel like gun violence hasn't personally affected me or it's not going to affect me. So right. I'm just gonna look the other way. Right. And there's and this, that can be dangerous, particularly right. catastrophic. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. There's a like a mentality against like snitching yes. that people have. It's almost like a fable, I feel like. Mm -hmm. I grew up hearing about, you know, mm -hmm. how someone definitely knows who shot Tupac, but no one's gonna say anything. <laughs> it's gonna happen to you. And absolutely. that's so awful that no one ever wants to say anything. So you you're very, you. very active here on campus here at Columbia College. You've done so much with different organizations and for those organizations. What do you have to do? What do you feel you need to do in order to you know, you're here telling people at home this story, mm -hmm. but what do you think you need to do in order to change that? And I'm not saying just you solely, but everybody plays a role in this. Everybody plays a role in what happens on our streets. What do you hope to have change in the next coming years with the guards of violence going up so drastically in the city? I think that the police department needs to have a serious look at themselves and the way that they handle things and have serious discussions about changing the way they handle things because clearly it's a problem. Mm -hmm. And in cities bigger than Chicago, we're not having the same problem. Chicago's always a city that's referenced when you think about gun violence. And I mean, recently um, Trump was saying that the, he thinks Chicago gun violence is worse than violence in the Middle East, which of course is such a hyperbolic way to describe violence in Chicago. But I feel like politicians like to talk about it because mm -hmm. it seems like they care about the issue, but then things aren't happening. So the police department needs to do more work. I I think politicians could do more work handling these issues. I'd love to see what, what Rahm Emanuel is planning to do to, to fix the way that these things are handled in the city, but I also think it's not just the police and, and politicians. I think that the way people handle it's very important too. We need to have more of a discussion about gun violence, especially like students here at a school like this. There's so many students in different colleges in Chicago who don't ever really talk about it and think about the impact it has. And this is, I mean, this is our city. We live here too. So, I mean, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, mm -hmm. like Dr. King said in the letter to Birmingham jail. So I feel like everybody needs to be talking about it and needs to be coming up with ways that we can fix this issue. I got one more question for you. We just had a DOJ investigation. Real quick, I want to know, do you think that's going to help CPD going forward? Well, I want to say that I do. I mean, but it's so disheartening to know that there have been efforts in the past or we've talked about in the past fixing these issues and they, they stay the same way. So it almost, it's so awful to just feel like I don't want to get my hopes up to just have that feeling about an issue like this. But yeah, yeah I mean, I really hope that that and, and this sparks more of a conversation and leads to more solutions. Bree, we appreciate you coming back to the 30. We always love having you here yeah. and we hope your cousin is in great spirits. We do. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, coming up next, two high school students, both with two tragic stories. One an eyewitness of a drive-by, the other just simply scared to walk out of her house. That's next. And author James T. Wiley is in the building to discuss his book, Soul Survivor. We'll be back. They said I couldn't dream. Called me a piece of trash and swore that's all I'd ever be. said a bottle couldn't see the ocean. Give up. Go back to the dumpster. But I didn't listen. I made my way. And now, what I've always wanted to be. We 
welcome you back to the 30. Now, my next guests are high school students living on the southwest side of Chicago. They have seen and experienced just some of the gun violence afflicting our city today. The Big Loop segment focuses on issues affecting the Windy City and with us to discuss in depth these terrible stories are Carla Mraz and Asil Padilla of Brighton Park and the Back of the Yards neighborhoods, respectively. You two, welcome to the 30. Thank you. I want to start with, actually with both of you, what schools do you guys go to, just to, just to start off? Uh, I go to Pathways in Education. Okay, and what school do you go to? Kelly Thomas High School. Okay, I'll oh, speak up. It's okay. It's all right. Speak up. Yeah. Where, where do you go to school? Thomas Kelly. She don't like her school. That's what it is. <laughs> She's like, I don't want to be there. But no, you guys are both seniors, right? Yeah. yeah. So both of you ladies are seniors now, and I'm just curious, growing up in the communities that I just mentioned mm -hmm. do you live in fear yeah constant how so give me an example it's just like in everyday life where there are shootings every night basically mm -hmm. and you don't know who it was mm -hmm. who it could be it could have been a family member it could have been a friend it could have been you you don't know mm -hmm. who's getting shot or who's doing the shooting mm -hmm. and it's like you can step out on any moment, you can get shot, or you can see somebody getting shot. Mm -hmm. It's just like, it's, it's a horrible thing to, f to be in fear mm -hmm. of your life or the life of someone you love. Now, I want to ask you this, Carla. What is it about walking out the home that instills fear within you? When you go outside, what goes through your mind? I feel like there's going to be another drive-by. Mm -hmm. and Because you witnessed a drive-by, yeah. right? How was that? very scary what happened explain the chain of events that well day. I was on my way to a school field trip mm -hmm. which was like five in the morning and like I live a block away from school so I could just walk it and that's when like this guy was driving in his car and another black SUV passed by and like shot him while driving and crashed into four houses down from mine mm. And, and I know that was just scary to see yeah. up close, right? Yeah. You hear it on the news all the time, and I think there was a big situation near the back of the Yards neighborhood not too long ago. What is it that needs to change? I know it starts with the developments. It starts with, you know, you talk about things socioeconomically that need to be better in these communities. But what do you all think needs to change from the higher-ups, from city officials? What has to change? I think what needs to change is the attitude towards it. Mm -hmm. Like, it becomes such a normality. Like gun violence, gang violence, oh yeah, okay, it happens everywhere, it's a big deal, but it is a big deal. It mm -hmm. is something that needs to get like more focused on and come at different angles because obviously something's not working, something's not happening yeah. for it to stop and it needs to, it needs to be picked out at the source. So. Your families, I know, care about you anytime you leave the house. Yeah. What do they think about what's going on? I'm curious, are they are they scared for you? Do they always say, come in at two o'clock? You're like, what is that about? How does that go? Oh, uh, well, my parents are really scared. Like, mm -hmm. they don't want me going out yeah. as much, which is not okay. Like, I want to go out and stuff, but they fear for me, and yeah. it's understandable. Yeah. How about you? How about your parents? My mom's constantly texting me like, oh, how are you doing? Are you okay? Um, has anything happened? Mm -hmm. and, you know, it's like it's like okay, mom, stop texting me, but like, mm -hmm. she she's worried. Cause it's she not because she wants to annoy you. I yeah. think sometimes we think that, but it's just to you know check up on you. And I think that's a little bit, you know, in this society now, you have people just trying to go to school and they can't even walk to school without having someone walk with them. And it's a little bit sad to say, but society wasn't always like this. So. As I mentioned earlier at the top of the show, there has been a shooting every single day in this city for the past two years. Do you have hope? Do you think it'll get better? I have hope with people, with people like us, with people like this, who are trying to bring light to the situation. I have hope that something is going to get done sooner mm -hmm. or later, and there's, it's progression. Mm -hmm. It's progressing. And in brown and black communities, it's always you know their last when it's when it comes to safety yeah. and when it comes to officials looking to say what's the problem here let's find a solution let's fix it has it ever crossed your minds that okay I need to move out of Chicago let's start with you yeah all the time what do you want to, if you move from Chicago what do you move I want to know where do you move out of state out of the state and yeah. it makes people scared that just Chicago alone makes people just want to move out of the state correct yeah it's scary I mean walking out of the home every day what do you hope will change from this day going home, what do you hope will change? Well, for gang mem members to realize that it's not worth it, their life isn't worth it, you know, because that's, that's mostly where 
it's coming from in our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. The gun violence is coming from gangs. And I just want them to realize that their life isn't worth putting in danger for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. So they can at least calm it down. Yeah. Any, any last words from you? I just want to know, what do you feel right now? Again, you live in fear. Mm -hmm. And this is not the right way to live for any human. No. What's going through your mind right now? As you're thinking, okay, after this segment, I got to go back home. <laughs> what, what is going through your mind? Anger. Mm -hmm. I hate how, like, things won't change after this. Yeah. You know? Sadly, right? Yeah. We appreciate both of you being here. And again, uh, we ask you to be safe, going home, coming from home, wherever you're going. Hopefully this changes because it's not fun living in fear. And I can just tell on your faces, it's like it gets tiring after a while. It gets exhausted. And hopefully people who are watching this show understand that you are being affected. You are being impacted by this on a daily basis. We appreciate you, Carla. We appreciate you, Seal. Or is it the other way around? Oh, other way around. <laughs> you get it. We appreciate you both. Coming up. In our Nat Sound segment, James T. Wiley is in the building to discuss his book, Soul Survivor, and his personal experiences with gun violence involving both his brother and his own son. Listen to me. I am captain of the track team. And, and if I'm late, She doesn't I'm really think she's going to get out of here, does she? Be nice. She's new. Hello, is anyone there? Wow. Even from our standards, you look awful. Oh, sweetie, what happened? Me? My friend Becky got to talk to this super cute boy, and I tried to act like I wasn't jealous, but I so totally was. And then out of nowhere, this concrete barrier just popped up. Maybe it was a semi. You mean you were driving? Yeah. I mean, I know the whole eyes on the road thing, but this was a super important text. Maybe you have to know, Becky. And texting? Great. But I, it was only like five seconds, and I'm a really, really fast texter, so it wasn't even a big deal. Actually, is she texting me back yet? Wow, I get like no bars in this place. I wonder if they have Wi-Fi here. Soul Survive is a tale that's never been told. Within the streets of Chicago lay a faction of officers of the law who are eager to achieve a goal within Chicago's police department that has less to do with their job description and more to do with their quest for money, power, and a piece of Chicago's underground economy. Casualties abound as the cops and long-standing members of street organizations end up in a deadly street poker match where the stakes include real estate holdings, drug markets, absolute power, and all the trappings of street life. However, neither contender realized that there's an omnipotent force that has consummate power and resources that only one omnipotent and sole survival withstands when the story unravels. Uh, can I get a backup on We welcome you back to The 30. Our Nat Sound segment covers stories and issues from a national perspective. Our next guest has been featured on several radio programs, including WKKC, WVON, and Power 92. He's also promoted his book, On the Road, at events throughout the Chicagoland area. Taking the nation by storm with his book, Soul Survivor, we welcome James T. Wiley, a.k.a. my cousins in the building. We welcome to the show, my man. What's going on, Josh? This book right here is going to impact so many people. When they, it's a great read, and even when we just showed that trailer, he was mouthing the trailer by heart. This is not a game. He <laughs> feels this every day. How long did it take you to write this book? It took me. Uh, it took me eight months to write it. Eight months. Eight months. Yeah, eight and months. Is it based off of any personal experiences? Of course, it's based off a lot of facts. That, you know, I was going through a personal experience when I wrote the book, mm -hmm. so that's what made me ask, actually start writing. And you've gotten a lot of acclaim by you've been, as I mentioned just moments ago, to so many programs talking about this book. What's been the reaction? Uh, the reaction been positive. That's good. You know, positive, and that's you know that that's the way that I look at it. You know, that's all. That's the only reaction that I'm basically looking for. There you go. Is a positive reaction. Mm -hmm. I didn't care if I sold one book when I wrote it, as long as I got positive feedback. From exactly. It. Exactly. And you got two. I think on Facebook, your page for this book is just blown up. And I think recently, because 
people are starting to connect with this book. Explain the, the premise behind the book, the relation between CPD and gang factions. Talk about that a little bit. It's everything that we see taking place right now. Mm -hmm. It's everything that we see taking place right now when it comes to Chicago, the gang violence, the street gangs mm -hmm. with the organizations, uh, the police officers and their parts that they play within the violence that's mm -hmm. taking place and the right. casualties and the people that we losing throughout mm -hmm. this whole result mm -hmm. of the root of what's going on mm -hmm. in this book, in this yeah. novel, with this, with the street violence and the, you know. It's everything. scary. I think it's scary because when you open this book from the first page on, and I haven't even finished, mm -hmm. but from the first page on, it's like, okay, this is real. This is really happening. Although it's, it's based on true events, but this is really happening on a daily basis in Chicago. And as I mentioned earlier, the DOJ has investigated the police department. I'll ask you the same question I asked one of our guests. Do you think it's going to get better? It can get better. Mm -hmm. It definitely can get better. You know, what we have to do is we have to reach back within the community and actually talk to those within the community, such as a person like myself that really knows what's going on that's mm -hmm. in the community every day and see this and mm -hmm. see the violence that's taking place and seeing where you hear gunshots and then next thing you know, you see the police, they don't come until the gunshots end, they not there right then and there when the gunshots taking place because they are the ones that serves and protects. Mm -hmm. They have the badge to serve and protect. Yeah. You know, so yeah. why out there using their badge? We can't run around with guns all day. We'll yeah. get took into jail mm -hmm. if you don't have your concealed and carry or your no. weapons license. Exactly. exactly. So they have the weapons license. Mm -hmm. They have the they have everything they need to actually stop what's going on. Yep. And in this novel that's where I get at is it's a reason it's possible these are the possibilities of why they don't want to stop it yeah and your book illuminates that in great detail of i think i think that's of a course. it's a great read and now i want to talk about you personally you've endured so much throughout your life and you've been afflicted by gun violence talk to me a little bit about your brother who was killed this was years ago i know but i know it still impacts you to this day yeah of course you know my mother she had uh you know my mother had three sons Correct. i'm the youngest of her three sons mm -hmm. and my brother that was shot i lost him to gun violence mm -hmm. in the year 2000 mm -hmm. and uh it definitely it definitely impacted me affected me in a lot of ways mm -hmm. that i wasn't prepared for right Right. You know, which is the reason that inspires me to keep writing, to keep writing, because I don't want their names, my brother name, to just go in vain and people exactly. just forget about them. And it's like it's 15 years later, now yeah. we're talking about them again. There you go. This is what I wanted from that. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what I learned from that. Mm -hmm. But at the time when my brother was killed, it was something that you actually couldn't really prepare me for because that was like my twin. Exactly. Exactly. We were only a year and three weeks apart. Yeah. One year and three weeks apart. Yeah. So it was different. We had a bond. You couldn't find him without finding me. Right. And the way that he was killed mm -hmm. by someone as close to us, it actually put me alert mm -hmm. to where I didn't have, you know, I didn't accept everybody as my friend. Exactly. Exactly. He taught you in a way. Yes. Now yeah. your your son also, he was shot recently. Yeah, my son, he was shot. He was just shot recently in December. Mm. How's he doing? He's doing better. Okay. He's definitely doing better. God is a blessing. He's definitely doing better. Great. You know, but at the time when he was shot, uh, what was going through your head during that time? I know you're not, uh, not again. You know, I know you're thinking that. What was going through your head at the time? I was. My first thought was, here it is. I'm trying to do everything positive. Exactly. In my life at this point. Right. Right. You know, from things, from experience and things that I've been through, I could have went back to the streets mm -hmm. upon my son being shot. Exactly. And been and, and indulged until brought violence with violence mm -hmm. because that's my child. Exactly. Right. Following that incident with my son, I see little girls getting killed, babies, right after. And it's still happening to today. So why indulge back in it? Yeah. Somebody had to step up and say, I'm gonna be the bigger person. I'm gonna be the voice to say, I'm gonna be the bigger person. Mm -hmm. And we need more of that. I think if people step up and actually begin to say stuff and do things like even writing books like you do, I know you've got a lot more ideas for books now just because you've been through so much. What's next for you? What's next? Next movie. Yeah. 
Yeah. Next, next is time for a movie. Yeah. Based on the novel. Mm -hmm. So the people who don't sit down and read or take the time, you know, because of lack of knowledge, we people don't like to sit down and read. Mm -hmm. So for the people that don't sit down and read, my next thing is a film. Yeah. Make a film out of it, so yeah. it catches the people who don't maybe have the time to sit down and read. Yep. Where can they get this book? Real quick, where can they get this? They can go online at soulsurvivoronline.com. Just mm -hmm. type in soulsurvivoronline.com and it'll log you straight into my website and uh, purchase the book. Or you could just go on Amazon. It's definitely on Amazon. You can look for me on Amazon, but yeah. I will you know, definitely go on soulsurvivoronline.com. It's a great read. Cousin Tony, I appreciate you being here. You've been through so much. Uh, it's you're going to be an inspiration to so many people. We thank you so much for being here. Thank you. All right, y'all. Coming up next is our advice column. You don't want to miss it. We'll be right back. There's one thing you can never have sex without. It's not something you buy. Or something you take. In fact, there's only one way to get it. It has to be given to you freely. It's consent. Because sex without it isn't sex. It's rape. Consent. If you don't get it, you don't get it. It's on us to stop sexual assault. Learn how and take the pledge at itsonus.org. And you came here in a suit. I like giving money to people in suits. <laughs> Why, thank you. <laughs> what makes you think Jensen knows more than your good pal Victor? Vicky T. The V card. Your life is not that depressing. My most intense dream was two weeks ago, and it was about a secondhand high off a Sharpie. I'm in college now. And I'm in the Twin Towers because everything's crashing down, and I'm not ready. I don't know. She probably met somebody on her free time. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Her what? Dad. We're in a generation where women can kind of do whatever they want. And you're pretty young, so I don't know why you don't understand that. Where did the sexism thing come from? All right, we welcome you back to the season three premiere of the 30, and this is the advice column where I give advice to those who are crazy enough to ask me. Now, we ask you to use the hashtag AskJosh30 on Twitter and other social media outlets with your questions, and we had a huge, very huge response, bigly response. Now, our producers chose three, and here they are. First question comes in from at the Harley Quinn, saying, I have a crush on this guy who's quiet and friends with all of my friends, so how do I get him to open up to me a bit more? My answer to you is, you literally said, uh, I have a friend who's quiet and I have a crush on him, which means maybe you should open up to him a little bit more. Maybe ask him how he is, how old are you, what do you do? Make conversation with him, allow him to give it his comfort zone, and if he really likes you, he'll respond immediately. And usually if a guy likes you, he'll make the first approach. But if you don't see that opening, then you gotta, you gotta get in there, get in where you fit in. Second question from at Lucky Loran, that name is taken, saying, quote, I commute to campus like an hour and a half and have a hard time making friends. Any suggestions? Well, here's the thing. The commute may be long, but can you possibly stay downtown a little bit longer? Can you interact with some of the folks on campus, some of your friends, create new friends, go to activities, go to a couple of bars if you're legal, go to some bars around town, and if you make friends, Tell them to see the city. Tell them to see greater than just downtown or the north side or the south loop. Tell them go to the south side or west side or wherever you're from, the outlying suburbs. You can make friends and you can keep friends that way as well. And finally tonight from at Renia saying, I'm trying to choose between multiple conventions and festivals, but with a college budget, help. Well, here's the thing. I'm broke too, so I can't really help. Okay, maybe I can, just a little bit. Maybe you can go to some, not all, some of the festivals taking place. Create a list. Let's say you have 10 festivals you want to go to the next six months. Pick five. Don't sh sell yourself short just because you don't have the money. Because if you make every decision based on how much money you have, you will never, ever live a happy life. So that's my advice to you from a broke person. 
All right, that does it for tonight's edition of The 30. We thank you so much for joining us. Next episode airs in April, so don't forget to join us then. Until then, so long from Chicago.